So it does run in the family. He is bound to be a genius, is what that tells us. Revelation chapter 18. Now we'll get into the judgment of Babylon from macaroni and cheese to the judge. It fits, really, if you think about it. There's plagues in this one and pestilence, and we just witnessed one right there. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 18. We'll cover the first eight verses. There's sort of a, uh, a little bit of a, of a distinction between verse 8 and the others, not too much. The, from After verse 8 is the world's response to what has happened to Babylon. Uh, but we're going to look at the first eight verses here this evening. And if you'd like a copy of that sent to your phone, we'll be happy to send you a copy of that clip to your phone. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Think about that. And cried with a mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and of the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, double unto uh, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, fill, her, uh, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she, has, she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and shall, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you. We thank you for your word. We ask your blessing upon the message tonight. Lord, I pray that you be glorified and honored. Lord, I do know that we certainly need your mercy and grace. We need your help with this. I pray, Lord, that the truth of what we're seeing here, that it would be clear that through it, Lord, we, we would learn how to draw closer to you as we have an understanding of what is to come and how serious you look at the events of this earth. And the fact is that you do remember iniquities, Lord. We love you. We pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, we're in a parenthetical chapter. If you remember, we finished up chapter 16. It was the last of the seventh vial. You had three sets of judgments. You had your seals, your trumpets, and the vials. We finished all those in chapter 16. And 16 concludes with that seventh one, with the great earthquake, as well as those, those 120-pound hailstones hitting the entire earth uh, with the return of Jesus Christ pretty much at the same moment as what we're going to be looking at. But that doesn't kick up again until, until chapter 19. 17 and 18 are parenthetical, giving us more information, especially, of course, about Babylon. Chapter 17, we've already dealt with in the last couple of weeks. That dealt with the religious side, the religion that the Antichrist established to help unify the world, to help establish his government and his power. We saw how this was, this was focused on the first three and a half years through pantheism and polytheism. Any form of idolatry, it didn't matter. He was combining. However, after his pseudo-resurrection, he no longer needed that religious system, and he destroyed it himself, forcing the only form of worship that became law was the worship of him, the, of, of Satan. He sets up the image in the temple, and it becomes mandatory worship at that time, and he destroys the religious system that he set up. Now as we come into chapter 18, we deal with the destruction of Babylon itself, especially along the lines of it as a political and economic force in the world. Look over in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll probably make one other reference to this section of verses here later on this evening. Verse 28. It says, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked into the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. This is the first time Babylon really rose to a place of prominence since Nimrod. It always had some, some prominence, but now you had another world empire, which really hadn't taken place since the Tower of Babel. And anyhow, and at the end of the 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdoms of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of 
uh, of the kingdom by my might and of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was yet in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and it goes on from there. And I'll cover the rest here in a little bit. What we have here is Nebuchadnezzar walking out of his palace and taking a look at the greatness of Babylon. He's looking around and seeing the great walls, the gardens that they're still known for really to this day, the, the hanging gardens, um, all that he had built in his empire. Of course, he's, he's coming at this from a prideful standpoint, which God is getting ready to judge, but we'll cover that later. And he's seeing the magnitude, though, of his kingdom. And again, this was the Gentile king that God raised up to, bring, to put judgment on the nation of Israel, particularly the nation of Judah, of course, at that time, to bring them into captivity. And then we come into Revelation chapter 18. We have another Gentile king. That's going to be the Antichrist, who is, who is now God is going to use to be judging there in Babylon right before the return of his son to establish his kingdom here on the earth. And so when we come into Revelation chapter 18, it deals specifically really with the economic side of the house and the destruction of the actual city of Babylon. As we've witnessed in our generation, we've seen the reality of a one, almost a one world economy, a global economy right now that the world has never seen on this magnitude before. There's always been some tie-ins between Europe and America and whatnot, and, but, but it wasn't necessarily that strong. One wasn't necessarily completely dependent upon the other. They wanted to trade with each other, of course. That always helped. But not to the scale that we're seeing right now with the entire world involved, from South America, from, from Australia, of course, to Asia, and the rise of China's economy, and, and how the global markets are fit together. Um, and that's going to be even more true when it comes to that of Babylon, when that rises to a world economic power. And so even now, if America's economy was to collapse, that would have effects around the world. That, that would not just affect our nation. That would have a massive global effect if our economy crashed. But it's not going to be nearly the magnitude of when the Antichrist establishes this economy uh, in Babylon that will truly dominate the world. And we'll, we'll get more into that here in just a little bit. Um, again, when the Antichrist is in power, he's going to set up his capital there in Babylon. It's going to be the economic center of the world. He's going to develop some type of economy that is going to enable to make men very rich. And think about the time frame that he's doing this. It really is incredible. This is during the tribulation time. It's in the middle of everything that's taking place. He is, he's, going to, he's going to be able to establish some type of economy. That means he's going to come out with some new economic system. It's not just going to be plain markets. I don't know what he's going to do, but there's something that's going to allow a, a multitude to live in luxury. To have, to have access to funds and money, according to Revelation chapter 18, he's going to set up one impressive economy. He's, and he's going to be doing this during the tribulation time. This isn't beforehand. He doesn't have the influence until this whole thing begins. And you can tell by reading this, by the way, it's not going to be communism that's dominating. It absolutely will be capitalism by the reading of this is the type of economy that he's going to be basing this on. Again, in chapter 17, we saw the destruction of the religious side of the house. And now we come into this political and economic side of the house, as well as the actual city itself. Again, I dealt with last week uh, um, how we were dealing with, because there's great debate on if Babylon here is just code, if it really means another city. Uh, many, like to, many like to promote the city of Rome, saying that it's Rome. This is going to be Rome. Um, or, or several other cities are mentioned. Some even tried to tie in Jerusalem. I don't mean, see how in the world you can do that, but some will tie in Jerusalem and, and a couple other different locations out there. But the Bible is clear here. It's mentioning Babylon. And when we look in the Old Testament, I brought this up, like, there's so many Old Testament prophecies about Babylon that have not been fulfilled. And when you compare those with what we see, the type of destruction hitting this city, it matches what we see in the Old Testament. So that's what gives a lot of credence to the fact that as what we're reading right here should be how we're, we're taught to interpret Scripture, and that is that grammatical, literal, historical interpretation of the Bible, which means this is the actual city of Babylon that sits on the river Euphrates. I read this last week. Let me read this again. This is taken from different verses in Isaiah chapter 13, 14, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51. And this was a segment, a paragraph that I read uh, quoting from a commentator about the future of Babylon. It says, one, the destruction will take place in the time the stars and sun are darkened, it says, in Isaiah. Remember the last, the fifth, the fifth, was it the fifth one or the sixth vial was darkness upon the kingdom. 
Two, the city will become as desolate as Sodom and Gomorrah. That's still not true to this day. Burned completely. We're going to see that's true at this event here that takes place in chapter 18. With no remains uh, whatever, according to Isaiah and Jeremiah. There it shall become desolate forever, with neither man nor beast entering into it anymore. This is all based on biblical prophecy. They're still re rebuilding Babylon now. It has not met the level of destruction that the Bible talks about yet. Again, a lot of times what we do is we view things. When a lot of the commentaries were written for the book of Revelation, I've had to set aside a lot of good men that I'll read because everything is viewed through the eyes of Rome because of the Protestant movement. And when they were writing it, that, that was the ultimate. So everything was viewed through that. They had those glasses on and how they were interpreting it. <clears throat> but there's a, there's a lot here that hasn't been fulfilled in Scripture. Two of the prophets speak that way, by the way, of what I just read. Four, it will be a time of judgment, not only for Babylon, but for all nations of the world. Five, its destruction will be followed by universal rest and a permanent peace. Six, its destruction is directly associated with the casting of Lucifer in the Sheol, Isaiah 14. Seventh, Babylon stones will never be used in the future construction elsewhere, whereas the present-day ruins of Babylon have been frequently plundered and reused in later construction. So again, when you put all this together, it is very likely... That when it speaks of Babylon, the Antichrist establishing Babylon, we're actually dealing with that real city. Now, when we, when it, also, though, we have to remember when it ties in, it's going to be a world capital. It's going to have a great, great influence on the world. Um, and so it deals also with the, the system of the world system that the Antichrist sets up. It dealt with the religious side of the house last week and more of the economic and the political side tonight. Today we're going to look at, in these first chapters, six different features about the judgment of Babylon. I put them all down as M's. You know, I'll give them to you real quick. If you remember them, I have no idea how that will help you in real life, but I'll give them to you anyhow. We have the message about the judgment, the magnitude of the influence for the judgment, the command to move from the judgment. Then we're going to see the method of the judgment, the motivation for the judgment, and the moment of judgment. So yes, there's six points tonight. I usually have two or three, so we'll be out by ten. I promise. These will, these will go quickly. We'll go, through these, we'll go through these quickly. First off, the message of the, of the judgment, verse 1 and 2. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened uh, with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So now we see here, John sees another angel come into play, different than the one in chapter 17, which was the one who finished with one of the vials had come unto John and said, listen, you need to see this. But this is a different angel. This angel comes out of heaven. Remember, the earth is pretty dark, especially we looked at that with the, with the one vial, whether that was just the kingdom of Babylon, what it represented the city there, or the, the entire world in darkness. Regardless of that, there is a lot of darkness, and we see this angel that comes down to the earth, and this angel has such power and such glory that as the angel comes down, he illuminates the entire planet. I mean, think of that for a second. The glory that is emanating from the influence and the power of this angel. I have no doubt when I thought about this, I didn't read this anywhere, but I was thinking about this, that when Satan, who's obviously incredibly active, he's the one behind the false prophet, the Antichrist, he's the one pulling the strings for all of this. I have no doubt he knows exactly who this angel is. I mean, we're not giving the name or anything, but when he sees this angel come down that has great power, illuminates the earth, he knows he probably has an idea who he's dealing with right now. And he knows judgment is coming, and he's right. So it's incredible to think about the power and glory of this angel. I also think that even though it illuminates the, the, the earth with all that's been going on, it scares them to death, the inhabitants of the earth. To see this angelic creature coming out of heaven... Uh, with this illuminating the earth, and then with a strong cry. So now the angel speaks. And he's letting the world know, which they've already, the, the, remember, the Lord had sent an angel earlier, letting the world know, all, flying throughout the earth, that Babylon's not going to last. You're believing in a wrong system. This angel comes down and is proclaiming the earth that Babylon is fallen. Now remember, we dealt with this, the wording like this before, actually in Hosea, and I believe earlier also in Revelation, he is pronouncing as this already happened. That's speaking to the certainty of the event that he's getting ready, to, getting ready to take place on Babylon, as if it already happened. It always spoke of certainty. And he's letting the world know it's over with. 
This, this system that you've gotten wealthy from, this what you put your trust in, that you thought would never fall, that sat as a queen, that you thought would know no sorrow, in a moment in time, it's going to be destroyed. <clears throat> the Bible speaks, of course, here in Revelation chapter 18, as well as in other places, of the utter destruction of the city of Babylon. Now, we've seen throughout, throughout Scripture how Babylon has always been a place of demonic activity from the Tower of Babylon. Again, it was the founding place for idolatry, based for false religion. As Nimrod tried to use this under his kingdom that he established in building this tower, which was religious in nature, for idolatry. We are seeing the beginning to spread of, of, of pantheism and polytheism throughout the globe. Look over in Isaiah chapter 13. Speaks of its utter destruction as well in similar terms to what we see in Revelation chapter 18. Isaiah chapter 13, starting in verse 19. And Babylon, the glory, uh, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. By the way, if you'll notice, that still has, this is a prophecy that has not come true yet. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherd make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satires shall dance there. Now, that is similar wording. It deals with the wild beasts. There's actually a lot of connotations there to demonic spirits as well. For instance, you can see, I really have uh, the pronunciation of that old English word, I'm not sure, but the satires here. When you, when you try and define that, it's interesting to try and trace it down. It basically means a hairy thing. <laughs> That's really what, really what it boils down to. Some say it's a goat um, that it comes into, but there's also connection in Leviticus to it too, uh, 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 of, of demonic spirits as well. I think that's more what it's dealing with here in regards to that. It's dealing with the desolation that there's basically no man left that follows what we see as it tells us in Revelation 18, it becomes the habitation of devils, of foul spirits, hateful birds. Now that, that could be either a reference, there's, again, there, there's also a tie in with the word that is used there for bird. It's, it, it's uh, um, I know it, I know it. It really doesn't matter, but I know it. Um, and that also has another demonic influence that we see. It's used in a demonic sense in two other places. It's only used there in the New Testament and then again in chapter 19. So it's actually when you're tied into the Old Testament that you see a demonic influence with it. So I believe that also could be either referring to more demonic spirits, stay, staying with the context, possibly though a reference is the same word as used in 19, to, to the same birds that are going to be devouring the bodies from Armageddon, devouring those who were destroyed in Babylon. So the angel comes down who illuminates the earth and cries with a strong voice the certainty of the destruction of Babylon that basically the only thing left is the demonic spirits that have influenced it. Now verse 3, the magnitude of the influence which leads to the judgment. I'm giving the M's out because it took me forever on all these M's, so you're getting them. <clears throat> all right, Revelation chapter 18, verse number 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So again, we have a massive influence here on all nations that have drunk with the wine and the wrath of her fornication. Now remember, we had a reference to this also in chapter 17 and verse 2, the fornication, speaking of idolatry, but that was on the religious side. That's, that's gone. So it's not dealing with it in regards to the religious system that was set up. This is different. Still idolatry, but what's different about it? Well, it tells us, it defines the idolatry in the text. Covetousness. The wealth that was established. The luxury that was in place. <clears throat> the fornication 
based here is based on materialism. Again, you can see what the Antichrist did, what Satan was doing. He's using the promise of wealth to get people to commit idolatry now as well as the image of the beast. Remember what the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, that covetousness is what? Idolatry. So multitudes are going to be committing idolatry by seeking to be rich through the Babylonian economy that's going to be established by the Antichrist. Again, the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This is during the tribulation. And so there's an economic powerhouse that is developed, and it's so attractive, it's so alluring, it's so uh, um, seductive to the world. They all want a part of it. They all want their share. And it's leading to idolatry through covetousness, through materialism. I have a little button. I beep here for water. It's pretty neat. Beep. I, I don't. It's beep. <clears throat> Again, Babylon will become the economic center of the world. I want to see this. This is also talked about in Zechariah. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 5. This is interesting. It shows who's behind the rise of Babylon as an economic powerhouse. Now, there's, for time's sake, I'm not going to go back to verse 5, but it's interesting what takes place in back in verse 5 is all this is, is set up, but the only point I need is from 9, 10, and 11. So I'm going to read just 9 through 11. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, which is an unclean bird. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel and talked with me, whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. All right. So what are we looking at right here? It's interesting here. We, you know, as this image is, is here taken up, as, as we have these two women with these wings, they're carrying this basket, the ephah here, which is an important. Now, you got to know what that basket is. That did represent economy. It was used, it was, it was the size of a bushel, it was used for a measuring thing, different goods and things would be sold, would be carried in it. And so this is being taken out, and when you read earlier in the chapter, you get more of the idea of it, of the wickedness that it represents and everything there. And so it's being carried by these creatures, these two women, over Shinar. What, what, what is this place? Just look over in the book of Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. Let's put, <clears throat> well, verse 2, we'll cover it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and brought the vessels up to the treasure of the house of his God. And there's other verses as well. It's another name for Babylon. It's another name for Babylon. And so we have this basket representing this economy. And the women are going to have really demonic creatures that are being carried because of the, of the unclean fowl there that's being established. And it, it's, it's a prophecy through imagery of Babylon being set up as an economic powerhouse, that the devils are behind it. This isn't something that God is. So I think that's a direct connection to what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 18 with the rise of Babylon as an economic powerhouse as prophesied in the book of Zechariah. This will take place. So again, the Antichrist is going to establish some type of economic system that will be incredible. It's going to allow multitudes to get rich. It's going to be a great enticement to the world. So the magnitude of the Babylonian system is worldwide. Look at verses 4 and 5. This is interesting. Remember, multitudes come to know Christ during the tribulation time. But look what a command goes out to some of them here. Now we see the command to move from judgment. And I heard another voice from heaven. 
this one coming out of heaven, I, I would likely say it's probably the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard another voice coming from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So now we have this command to move God's people to separate from Babylon. Of course, there's two reasons that are given. One, not to partake in her sins. Again, there's a lot of there's a lot here. We can a lot of directions I can go with this. We could really just preach in that verse series of topical messages on this. But if you think you can play with the world that will not affect you, you are wrong. That's what the Lord's saying here. For some reason, there were believers who had converted during this time. Remember, the greatest revival the world will ever ever know will come about during the tribulation time. The the overall multitude will be martyred for their faith. But many will survive up into the very return of Christ. But here we have something interesting taking place. Some of those who converted for some reason are in Babylon. To the point the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, get out. Lest ye be partakers of her sins. Get out. You just can't think that you can just play with that stuff and it's not going to affect you. It will. The Lord knew the likelihood of what would take place because they're still in the flesh when, when all that Babylon was offering. The likelihood that they would fall into sin. So he tells them, number one, get out of there to avoid. So you're not partaking in their judgment. Number two, to avoid the judgment that is coming. To avoid the judgment that is coming. Again, why would some of the believers be there? I think there's two reasons that we can see in other cases throughout Scripture as to why you'd have some believers who are there that should not be there. Two reasons. One, I would say this. The world at this time, especially when you come to know Christ, is going to be a very hard place to live. It's going to be hard to find anything to eat. And ba- Babylon is going to be very, very enticing. I-, I think it's similar to when Abraham went to Egypt when the, f- w- w- when the famine hit. He didn't walk by faith. He didn't seek God. He just said, listen, here's the answer without seeking God, without walking by faith. I think that's one of the reasons why. Two is just the attraction of the world system, the wealth and the money that are going to be flowing out of this system is going to be enormous. It's not unlike the temptation for us to follow the things of the world. You know, we have multitudes of Christians today who see the nice lifestyles and the traction to this world, and it grabs them. That becomes their focus. Of course, the Bible tells us we are not to love the world nor the things that are in the world. And so the command comes forth. The Lord's telling them, get out, move, separate from it. We see the Lord doing this many times in Scripture, such as with Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot, telling Lot to get out of there. And by the way, the influence was strongly affected in Lot's family. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. There's always a call from the Lord for us to separate from the things of the world. Too often we're too busy trying to be conformed to the world instead of allowing God to transform us. I've, I taught the, 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 actually the past two of the last three Sundays in the uh, young adults class. And uh, this past Sunday we were talking about along these same lines of the influence that's coming in the churches. It's amazing how much influence the world has on churches today. And it's looked at as a good thing. It is. Go, I, I got some images that I showed in the Sunday school class. I want to show those. There's, there's three different images here. And you can see where the world's affecting the church, not the church affecting the world. And again, this is promoted as a good thing. I don't have it. I thought about it. I actually had a couple already I was going to show tonight from Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. That's what they call themselves anyhow. And how they look similar to some of this. Let's go ahead. I don't know which one's first. Let's go ahead and show it. This is a pastor here. The Apostle of Cool. Yeah, that, that, you know, you can see the worldly influence all over. Go to the next one, please. There we go. Yes. This is a pastor of a church, by the way. No influence on the world there whatsoever, huh? But we're not to be conformed to this world. Yet this is promoted as something good. And by the way, we have, in, they say we're not going to that level. You're, they're getting pretty close to us, some independent fundamental Baptist churches. You want to know why it feels, 
It, feel, it fills the pews. Watch, let's go, to a, let's go to the next photo. This is, of course, a church. It's basically turned into a place of entertainment center. I have, a, I have another photo. It's not up there right now. The exact same lighting, same setup. Not quite as many guitars. I think there's only two guitars in it. But it is an independent fundamental Baptist church. One, one to consider one of our key churches. And it's switched to this. That's allowing the world to influence you. That's not coming out of Babylon. That's becoming like Babylon. All right, that's good. Thank you. And remember when, remember when the nation of Israel came out of Babylon, when the decree went forth that they could return to Israel? Think about that. The decree went forth, you can return. A small number did. Three different times they were, they were able to come back. Three different. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah led returns back to, back to Jerusalem. Compared to the population that was in Babylon, a small majority returned. Babylon affected them too much. And that was, that, was Bab- that was Babylon's plan for captivity, by the way, was to make you comfortable. That's how they did that. It wasn't through prisons and chains and slavery. It was, we're going to bring you to Babylon, and we're going to let you partake of this, and you're not going to want to go back. It worked. It worked. The devil uses that strategy so often. <clears throat> so the command comes forth to depart. Don't be seduced by this world. It talks about how her sins basically have piled up to heaven. Again, the Tower of Babel never reached heaven, but, but her sins here of Babylon certainly did. We, sin, we see different sins reaching into heaven different times in Scripture from Noah, Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Nineveh, and now here. So there's a command to separate so you're not partakers of her sin because the judgment that is to fall. Verse 6, now we get into the method of the judgment. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, uh, filled, fill to her double. All right, let's go over this. It's, it's, it's a tongue twister, that's for sure, but it's not, not quite hard to understand. It's much more difficult to say that verse than it is to understand that verse. He's basically he's dealing with rewarding here, rewarding the sins, the vengeance is coming, the judgment is coming. God does judge sin, and that's getting ready to take place. This is a call for vengeance to repay. This is why, by the way, vengeance belongs to God, not to us. We are to be kind unto our enemies. Vengeance is the Lord's. It's not ours. The day will come with repentance doesn't take place that that, that judgment will hit. And that's what we see in taking place uh, right now on Babylon. And so here it says double. So what does he mean double? Uh, Again, it has the idea of something full to overflowing. Their iniquity is overflowing, so should their judgment be. Look over in Exodus 22. We'll, we'll show you a biblical pattern here a little bit with this. Exodus chapter 22. I'm going to read a few different verses. I want you to notice some things here. Verse 7. This is in the Mosaic Law. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep and to be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, what does he have to do? Let him pay double. Let's go over to um, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read just a couple of verses here real quick. If you're not there, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I want to move through this quickly. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord, Lord's hand double for all her sins. Again, the vengeance took face, place in a double manner here. We see in Isaiah 61, 7 in a good sense, actually. The Lord does the same thing with His grace as He does with His judgment. Uh, verse 7, I believe it is. For your shame, for your shame, you shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Ever, everlasting joy shall be unto them. So not only is it with His, with his judgment that is double, but it's also with His grace. And it has the idea to fulfillment, to, 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 to a satisfaction, to an abundance. 
So this is the method of God's judgment. It's describing something complete, overflowing. And so when God judges Babylon, as is getting ready to happen, you think of the sins of Babylon. I mean, unlike any other nation or system in the world, it had a worldwide influence literally since the Tower of Babel. And the Lord's saying, listen, when this judgment hits, it's going to be tremendous because of the greatness of the sins. Which is interesting when we get into the vials here. I'll try and make that point when I finish up here. Let's go on to the fifth. There's six points to this, remember, that we're going to number five now. The motivation for the judgment in verse number seven. Motivation for the judgment. Verse number seven. How much she had gloriously glorified herself, excuse me, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she, for she hath saith in her heart, I sit as a queen and, and, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. So now we see motivation for the judgment, and there's three sins here that are given, which are also feeding the judgment that is to come, the motivation for it. We see self-glorification. How much she hath glorified herself, pride. One of the sins that God absolutely hates throughout Scripture is pride. Remember, the very first step in order to draw close to God is what? It's humility, tumbleness. Pride always leads to God's judgment. We're not going to go back there and read for time's sake right now, but if we did, we could see what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he went out with pride and looked out on his kingdom there. He went out with all this pride, and next thing you know, God... God removes his pride in an instant and humbles him. He's eating in the grass and the field like an ox. As, you know, as the, basically seven years passes, he's in this condition. It is, he's unshaven, hair is growing everywhere, his nails grow. It's a, just a disgusting picture of what takes place. He humbles him just like that. Pride always leads to God's judgment. How about Herod when he didn't give God the glory? Remember that thing in Acts chapter 12? God killed him basically on the spot, and the worms ate his body. The Lord judges pride, especially when self-glorification is taking place. And that's what it's saying. This is one of the sins of Babylon. It was glorifying itself. But not only did it have self-glorification, it also had self-gratification. As we see there in the verse, they were living for luxury, for pleasure. Life became about that bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. That would be a theme of Babylon. What it can offer you, the luxury, the delicacies of life. Remember, even do it for time's sake, we were going to turn that, I'd write this verse down, Deuteronomy 17, 16, and 17. Israel was even warned against multiplying horses, gold, and silver through commerce with Egypt. The reason why the warning was given, because it would result in this independence, a preoccupation with luxury rather than with the Lord. What the danger was, life would become about pleasure and about self. That's what Babylon's offering the world. Again, that takes focus off of God. It feeds covetousness, which is idolatry. So the worship that man seeks, which is there in every man, which they don't tend to recognize when it comes to materialism, but that's what gets the worship. So we had self-glorification taking place. We have self-gratification taking place. And then self-exaltation taking place, as well as a self-sufficiency here by the wording. She sets herself up as a queen. Says, I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. A queen is this independence, has need. It's, it's, it's in control. It certainly isn't true. I'm no widow. I'm going to see no sorrow. And the world believed this. Remember, the world believed what the Antichrist was promoting, and in the power of Babylon. Again, the, the rise of the city is going to be incredible. The economic system that's going to be established, really, you think about it, it's, 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 it, you think about what takes place, especially when we get into the trumpets. A third of the ocean is decimated. You better believe that for any world economy to survive, you need that ocean. Somehow it survives that. As well as everything else that's taking place. It, this economy that the Antichrist establishes is surviving it. 
The world is in awe of it and partaking of it. Because she lifted herself up, just like Satan did, by the way, God will judge. Then the last point, the moment of judgment, verse number 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So now it speaks of the judgment that hits Babylon. That this judgment comes in a day. It speaks of suddenness of it. It's going to be swift in a moment. It gives the order of the events as they'll take place. I don't think it's necessarily speaking of a 24-hour day, just the suddenness of it, of the rise of everything. Obviously, it's going to begin on one particular day. But it mentions from, a, from the plague, a pestilence. Then death resulting. Then mourning is going to hit. Then there's going to be a famine that's going to hit the city, followed by this massive fire that will be consuming everything, literally. Complete destruction and instant incineration taking place. We can speculate about what that's going to be. It could just simply be a miracle from the hand of God. You know, whether that's some type of nuclear explosion, I, I don't know. It really doesn't matter. But we do know that there's going to be a consuming fire that is just going to incinerate this city that nothing, nothing will be left. After they go through this measure of sorrow and the suffering uh, that, that was in, in agreement with the level of their sins and the magnitude of their sins, the repayment is sufficient. It's going to match that double. And then this fire will sweep through rapidly and completely and utterly destroy a city. Now, what is interesting, which I don't think is possible, is many of them relate this back to the vials, that that's what it's speaking to. I, I really don't see how that's at all possible for several reasons. One, this is specifically dealing with Babylon. While the vials, the judgments, whether it's the seal of the trumpets or the, or, or the vials, but especially the vials, of course, by the nature of them, they're worldwide. This is dealing with Babylon. And when we continue this next week, what we're going to see is, is that the kings of the earth, they're mourning. They're like, what just happened? If this is, is referring to that seventh vial, there's no time for that to take place. Those kings could care less what's happening to Babylon because of the destruction of the whole world from that earthquake and from those hailstones falling out. Well, the population is just going to be decimated by that, by the way. I mean, decimated when Christ returns. So what I think what we're seeing here in, in chapter 18 is not dealing with the vials or the trumpets or the seals. I think it's a special level of judgment that is put on Babylon. That's put on Babylon. I think that's what makes the most sense. Because as we're going to see, the kings of the earth will mourn. And these, the vile judgments are worldwide while this is local. And then next week, we're going to continue with this and look at the reaction to what is taking place. We'll finish up chapter 18 next week. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. We're heading into a time of invitation. First off, perhaps you're here right now. You're not even certain that you are converted. You don't know what would happen to you if you were to die right now. Think about that. If you were to die right now, where would you go? What would happen to you? Because when you die, make no mistake about it, death is when your soul separates from your body. That is the moment you are dead. Death, the word even means separation. Where is your soul going? I assure you it's not going to sleep. It's going to heaven or it's going to hell. You say, Pastor, I don't know, or I am concerned it is going to hell. Let me pray for you, all right? What I want you to just raise your hand where I can see it. If that's you, say, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. I want you to pray for me. Just raise your hand where I can see it. I see some small children, and that's about it. But if you did put your hand up, then I, I did not see it. All right, Christian. There's a lot this world is facing and is coming. In our text today, we did have some very good principles, even for us right now. We live in one of the most wealthiest countries of, of the world right now. 
the wealthiest, not one of them, the United States of America. Therefore, we run into the same temptation that the world is going to have trouble with when it comes to that of Babylon, of being captivated by the luxuries, of beginning to live for those things. When that takes place, you've just moved into idolatry. Now, we all live here. I understand that. But what is it that you're living for? That's the question. And then-